What is free software? Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. Typical software that most people still use is proprietary software. That means non-free software, software that keeps the users divided and helpless. Typically, the users are divided because each one is forbidden to share with anyone else and the users are helpless because none of them have the source code so they can't change anything they can't even tell what the program is really doing but free software respects the users freedom what does that mean free software means that the users have four essential freedoms freedoms that every software user ought to have freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and change it so that it does what you wish when you run it. Freedom two is the freedom to make copies of distribute them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. Freedom two is also known as the freedom to help your neighbor and freedom three is the freedom to help build your community. If a program gives you all four of these essential freedoms, that means it's free software because the social system of the program's distribution and use is ethical, respecting the freedom of everyone. But if one of these freedoms is substantially missing, that means the program is proprietary software it means that the social system of the program's distribution and use is unethical. Such software should not be developed and it should not be used. Distrib distributing, developing proprietary software is not a contribution to society. It creates a social problem. And the aim of the free software movement is to correct this problem by moving to free software. But why define free software this way? What makes these four freedoms essential? Freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to distribute copies of the program to others, is essential on basic moral grounds so that you can live an upright life as a good member of your community. If you don't have freedom number two, then you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment whenever your friend says could I have a copy of that program at that moment you will be forced to choose between two evils one evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program the other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program being in the dilemma you ought to choose the lesser evil which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. What makes this evil the lesser evil? We can assume that your friend is a decent person, helpful, and deserves your cooperation. Because if he didn't, you just say, why should I help you? That case is no problem. Therefore, let's look at the case which is a problem where it's a decent person and a good friend. Whereas, the developer of the proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, which is doing something very bad. So if you can't help doing some kind of wrong to somebody, better to choose the wrong that's directed at somebody who deserves it, somebody who has done wrong, the developer of the proprietary program. However, to be the lesser evil does not mean it's good. It's never a good thing to make an agreement and break it. Some agreements are inherently evil, and keeping them is worse than breaking them. This is one example. But breaking, making the agreement only to break it is not a good thing. And if you do give your friend a copy, what will he have? He will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. That's not a very good thing either. That's almost as bad as an authorized copy. <clears throat> so, 
once you have clearly understood this dilemma, what you should really do is make sure you're never in it. There are two ways to do that. One is, don't have any friends. That's the method suggested by the proprietary software developers. And the other method is, don't use the proprietary program. That's the method I've chosen. If somebody offers me a program on the condition that I promise not to share it with you, I will say no, because to agree to that condition would be a betrayal and I won't do it. So, that's the reason for freedom number two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to distribute copies to others when you wish. Freedom zero is essential on practical grounds so that you can have control of your own computing, which means to be in control of your own life in use of computers. It may be surprising, but there are proprietary programs that even restrict how you can use an authorized copy. They may restrict who can run them, or how much, or how many, or on which computers, or for what purpose. This is obviously not having control of your own computing. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough, because that's just the freedom to either do or not do whatever the developer already decided. So the developer still controls you. He controls you through the code of the program. So in order to really have control of your own computing, you need freedom number one, the freedom to study the source code and then change it so that the program does what you want. With this freedom, you decide what your computing is instead of the developer deciding for you. If you use a program without freedom number one, you can't even tell what it's really doing. Many non-free programs have malicious features which are not typically announced to the users. For instance, many non-free programs are spyware. They report on what their users are doing. One non-free program you may have heard of that spies on the user is called Microsoft Windows. When the user of Windows, and I won't say you because I'm sure you wouldn't use a program like this, but when the user of Windows uses the Windows feature to search her own files for a word, Windows sends a message saying what word was searched for. That's one spy feature, but there's another. When Windows XP asks for an upgrade, it also sends a message with a list of all the software installed on the machine. That's another spy feature. Microsoft did not tell the public about these spy features. People had to figure them out, and it wasn't easy. So there may be others that we don't know about. Please, however, don't think that it's only Windows that spies on the user. Windows Media Player also spies on the user. It reports everything that the user looks at. But this is not something that is unique to the most evil of companies. Microsoft is just another proprietary software developer and lots of them spy on the user. For instance, RealPlayer also spies on the user in the same way as Windows Media Player and I think RealPlayer did it first. But malicious features get worse than just spying. There's also the functionality of refusing to function where the program says I don't want to let you see this file. I don't want to let you copy part of this file. I'm not going to print this file for you because I don't like you. This is also known as Digital Restrictions Management or DRM. The intentional functionality of refusing to function for you because the program isn't designed to serve you. It's designed to serve someone else by controlling you. There are also back doors, malicious features designed to attack the user. One proprietary program that you might have heard of that has a back door is called Microsoft Windows. You see, when Windows asks for an upgrade, 
Microsoft more or less knows the user's identity, which means that Microsoft could deliver to him an upgrade designed specifically for him. In other words, Microsoft can take control of his computer and do anything it wants to him. That is the back door whose existence we can deduce from known facts. Are there others? Maybe. We can't tell. A few years ago, some programmers in India who were working on developing Windows XP were arrested and accused of working for Al-Qaeda, accused of trying to put in another backdoor that Microsoft wasn't supposed to know about. Apparently, that attempt failed. Was there another? We don't know. But Microsoft was caught in 1999 having installed a backdoor in some server software on behalf of another dangerous, powerful, violent organization, the United States government, specifically the National Security Agency. And this illustrates the fact that you simply can't trust a non-free program. And yet all the non-free software developers that don't give you the source code demand blind faith, blind total trust. All non-free software is therefore just trust me software and yet we know that many of those developers have betrayed their users already. Of course there are also those that have not. But there's no way anyone can tell which is which. There are the non-free programs in which we know there are malicious features, and there are the non-free programs in which we don't know, but we can never be sure that any given program doesn't have a malicious feature, because we can't see the source code. So, they all demand trust based on nothing, and none of them really can be trusted. We can't tell which of those developers are the ones that don't put in malicious features. But what about them? Even though they don't put in malicious features, they're still human, so they still make mistakes. Their code has errors. And the user of a program without freedom number one, the freedom to study and change the source code, is just as helpless facing an unintentional error as he is facing a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program without freedom number one, you're a prisoner of your source of your software. We, the developers of free software, we are human too, so we also make mistakes. Our code also has errors. The difference is that we don't keep you prisoner of our errors. We respect your freedom to correct them. If, you, if there are errors in our code, you can change them. You can change anything in our code that you don't like. We can't make ourselves superhuman, but we can respect your freedom. However, freedom number one is not enough. Freedom one is the freedom to personally study and change the source code. And that's not enough because there are millions of computer users that don't know how to program. They can't personally exercise freedom number one. But even for programmers like me, freedom number one is not enough because there's just too much free software for any one person to study and master it all and make all the changes that she might want. So the only way we can fully take control of our own computing is to do it working together, cooperating. And for that, we need freedom number three, the freedom to distribute copies of our modified versions when we wish. This freedom makes it possible for us to work together, changing the program to do what it is we want. Suppose there is a free program and there are a million users who want a certain change. Well, by chance, a few thousand will know how to program and someday a few of them will make the change they wanted and distribute it and all those million users can adopt that change. So they'll all get what they wanted even though most of them didn't know how to write it themselves and the rest could have but they didn't have to because someone else did it for them. And this shows how all users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can directly take advantage of freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, 
and freedom to the freedom to distribute copies when you wish. You don't have to program to do those things. Freedoms one, the freedom, and three, the freedom to study and modify the source code and then to distribute your modified version, these entail programming. So any given user can take advantage of these freedoms to the point that he knows how to program. But when programmers do these things, all the other users can then install those modified versions distributed under Freedom 3. So everybody gets the benefit of the four freedoms. And the result is democracy. Because free software develops under the control of its users. Proprietary software develops always under the control of its developer. Its developer decides what to let you do, and the developer decides what not to let you do, and there's nothing you can do about it. With free software, if you are motivated enough, you always can do something about it. You can, if you know how to program, you can change it yourself. If not, if you really care, you can learn how to program or you can convince your cousin the programmer and do some other favor for her. Or you can put, get together some money and pay a programmer to make whatever change you wanted. Of course, it's usually businesses that take advantage of that option, but anyone can. So we always can change the programs if we want to enough. What happens, therefore, if there are a thousand users who want a certain change in a free program and none of them, let's suppose, knows how to program. They can take advantage of the four freedoms by getting in touch with each other and then starting an organization which they all join and the idea is that each one has to pay money to join and that way the organization gets money and can hire some programmers to make the change and then release their modified version so they use freedom number one and freedom three, and thus these users get the change they want. Of course, once the organization is set up and has collected the money from the members and has to hire someone, it has to choose who to hire. And at that point, the people in the organization will talk to various programmers asking each group when could you do this? What would you charge? Please show us what you've done already so we can judge your abilities. And this illustrates an important fact. Free software brings with it a free market for all kinds of support and service. Because anyone who has a copy of the program can study the source code and master it and pr start providing support. By contrast, proprietary software generally means a monopoly for support. Only the developer has the source code, so only the developer can make any change. If the user wants a change, the user has to beg, Oh, almighty developer, please make this change for me. Sometimes the developer says, Pay us and we'll listen to your problem. If the user pays, the developer says, Thank you. In six months there will be an upgrade. Buy the upgrade and you'll see if we fixed your problem and you'll see what new problems we have in store for you. Therefore, this monopoly of support is very painful. And thus, all the organizations that believe a free market is advantageous and that say that good support is essential for them ought to be stampeding over to free software so that they can get the best support for their money. Now this leads us to a paradox. Because usually when there's a choice between products to do a job, we say there's no monopoly. But when there's a choice between proprietary programs, then yes, there is monopoly. Because if the user chooses this program, then he's stuck afterwards in this monopoly for support. But if the user chooses this proprietary program, he's stuck afterward in this monopoly for support. So it's a choice between monopolies. The only way to escape from monopoly is to escape from proprietary software. 
to escape to the free world. And that is what the free software movement is all about. We have built a new continent in cyberspace. A continent where everyone is welcome to come and live in freedom. And that's the purpose of it. We developed the GNU operating system so that it can be a place in cyberspace that we can go and you can go so that you and we can all live in freedom. Because it's a virtual continent, it has room for all users. And because we built it, we didn't have to take it away from any indigenous peoples. Everyone legitimately is welcome in the free world of the GNU plus Linux system. I hope that you will all move to free software and live in freedom with us. But we can't take for granted that freedom will last forever. Freedom is frequently threatened. That's what life is like. In order to keep your freedom, you have to be prepared at any time to defend your freedom. When people are not willing to defend their freedom, we get something like the United States today, where our most basic freedoms, such as the freedom not to be put in prison without a trial, have been taken away by our own leaders who say they're protecting us from some other secondary enemies. So, you must, if you, value, if you want to have freedom, you must be ready to defend it. If we are to succeed in defending our freedom, there must be many of us prepared to defend it. But that requires many of us who value freedom, who appreciate it. And in order to appreciate and value our freedom, we first need to know what it is. And in the community of users of the GNU plus Linux system, we haven't got very far on this. Most of the users of the GNU plus Linux system have never even heard the ideas I've told you today. And the reason is that when the GNU system was finished off by the development of the kernel Linux by Linus Torvalds, when the two were combined, the almost finished GNU system and the kernel Linux, were, when they were put together to make a complete system that you could install in a PC, people got confused and they thought the whole system was Linux. And as a result, they tended to listen to the philosophical views of Linus Torvalds, thinking he had done the whole thing. Now, as it happens, Torvalds doesn't agree with these ideas of freedom of the free software movement. He never did. He likes to refer to himself as apolitical. Now, when you say you're apolitical, you're actually making a political statement. You're saying, don't pay attention to those political issues. To make your decisions based on other criteria. And he advises people to choose software based on practical convenience alone. He says that we shouldn't value freedom. We shouldn't insist on freedom. And we shouldn't work together to defend each other's freedom. Well, when people listen to him, what happens? They don't value freedom. They aren't ready to defend it. And our community is weak when our freedom is threatened. Starting in 1998, some people stopped talking about free software and started using a different term. They coined the term open source and they promoted this as a way to talk about the same free software without saying free software and without ever presenting it as an ethical issue of right and wrong. So the result is that today most of the users of GNU slash Linux have hardly heard the term free software and have never heard the philosophical ideas that it stands for. So they think that the, what's good about this software is that it's powerful and reliable. 
Well, I'm glad if free software also turns out to be powerful and reliable. I appreciate that too. But if we're going to defend our freedom and keep our freedom through the years, we need to teach these people to appreciate freedom and value it and defend it as well. And that's a place where we need your help. We need your help in explaining these ideas to other people. We need your help in doing work to defend free software, in technical work such as developing software and manuals, and in political organizing to campaign against the dangerous laws that are proposed in many countries that would take away the right to develop free software. India is right now considering a change in copyright law that would follow the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the US. This law, if adopted, would prohibit free software for important jobs such as playing a DVD. Not that long ago, India considered a law to authorize software patents. That was blocked through the help of friends of the Free Software Foundation of India. So that law, if it had been adopted, would have meant that every software developer was constantly in danger of getting sued because of the techniques implemented in the program. Complicated programs combine thousands of different ideas and techniques. So if only 10% of them are patented, that means hundreds of patents, each one prohibiting some piece of a, of a large program. The proprietary software developers sometimes can get out of this problem by paying for licenses. But free software developers don't usually have the money to do that, so we're likely to be totally excluded. 23 years ago, when we started developing the GNU operating system, nobody knew if we would, if we in the free software community would have the capability to develop such a large collection of software. Today we've done that and much more. Today there are two basically different free software operating systems. There are two graphical interfaces that are free, two office productivity suites, and thousands of free application programs. So we've shown that we can develop the software that people need. We haven't done all of it yet, there's still a lot of work to do, but we're within perhaps an order of magnitude of doing the whole job. What's not certain today is whether powerful, wealthy companies will let us continue to serve the public. F to make sure that we can continue doing so, we now need political organizing to add that to the work of software development. I hope that you will join in one part of the movement or the other. We need your help.